This is Vern Venom Grimsley, on campus. Fatherhood of God as what, as omnipotent? Yes, omnipotent, eternal, no. infinite, all those good words. As the Judeo-Christian Christian ethic of God? Ah. Yeah, I can dig that. You can? Uh -huh. I'm going to demand child support. Why, as a child of God? <laughs> I had to mess with child support. I want some bread. I want $1,000 a month to keep me alive until my dad gets... Man shall not live by bread alone. Let me ask you a question. What do you think, as a person, what do you think Jesus was like, personally? I think he was, uh, well, Galilean fishermen were known to be pretty rowdy characters, for one. They went out and got drunk a lot. But uh, he had a lot of, you know, he had, he, everything he said was really, really good. I believe that he did perform miracles. I believe that he was, in a sense, divine or he had such, you know, far out consciousness that he could do things like that. Um, in other words, that Jesus was. What's important is his disciples were all, you know, Galilean fishermen, were a bunch of really rowdy characters, and he was just going around and he was, you know, he wasn't clean, he was dirty. I think that there is a difference between the religion of Jesus and the religion about Jesus. Oh, no. Christ, Christ, I believe that Christ, uh, when he died, so did Christianity because Paul came by and just really destroyed it. Half the preachers here say they can save you. Half the people know they're not saved when a guy leaves. It's a matter of the authentic inward process, what happens in a person's life. If a person just superficially nods his head and says, what'd you say? I said you're climbing out of the syllogism. Well, no, wait a minute. Obviously, it makes a difference whether you really mean something or whether you only do it superficially. Yes, but if a person is authentically seeking for God, I believe he will find. That's what Jesus meant when he said, seek and you will find. You agree with that? I agree with you. You think that if a person does seek for God, he will yeah, find the God? The problem is that I think many people think that they are searching for God, they are not really. You know, they are trying to satisfy their own self rather than seek sincerely and honestly for God. But if a person does look for this spiritual truth, I'm absolutely convinced that he will find it. You don't think so? No! Why not? You step on toes when you look for the truth. So many people believe they already know the truth. It's one very interesting historic and theological observation that every great religion has begun as a heresy in its own time. He was accused of heresy. Therefore, I think it ill behooves a person automatically. Well, Christ was too. In order to stay great, it has to stay a heresy. I would say that if it is concerned with love, and this was Jesus' main teaching, the love of God and man. When per people accept them, you know, are they supposed to give up everything they do? When they accept the teachings of Jesus, you mean? Yeah. Jesus was not so concerned telling people what not to do as he was concerned telling people what to do. In other words, he wasn't just drawing a great long list of things from which a person ought to abstain, but rather saying to love God and love man and live in faith as a son of God. And I believe all men are sons of God if they'd only dare to believe it. You think that makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, but it sounds it's hard. very dull. How much do sounds dull? Yes. Well, wait a minute. What about Jesus himself? Just a second. I want to answer this. Jesus himself was hardly a dull person. He went back one time to his own hometown, to Nazareth, and they tried to throw him over a cliff. He ended up put to death for what he believed. Time and again, he lived anything but a dull life. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, on, on, your, on what you believe, could I ask you, what, how do the Ten Commandments stand? The Ten Commandments? I would say the Ten Commandments constitute a minimal morality. In other words, that Jesus, in giving the two great commandments, was giving the positive side. How about Proverbs? What about Proverbs? Now, those, I believe that Proverbs are... In the Bible, in the Old Testament, you mean? Old Testament. I believe that Proverbs are really, really good, heavy sayings, you know, that came from a, an enlightened man. I would concur with that. Yeah, and the Ten Commandments are basics for living and just for decency. Yes. Because, like, the, the, for instance, the adultery laws would uh, take care of any, any hassles or any strife. And I would only make the one point that I think a dill pickle can keep a certain number of the Ten Commandments. It doesn't bear false witness, it doesn't, and this sort of thing. So I would say that beyond that, and I think we'd agree on this, is this tremendously powerful injunction to love God and love man. Well, then when Christ gave the two great commandments, just live by those. I agree. Man. Just follow the golden rule. I agree very strongly that this is the challenge, to live in love for God and man. Did you ever notice that in none of the Gospels is there ever a mention of Christ ever laughing, nor of any of the Apostles ever laughing? Nowhere in the Gospels does Christ ever laugh. And as far as I'm concerned, a founder of a religion who does not laugh is not the founder of a religion for people. Neither in the New Testament. That is a very dull religion. That is a very dull religion indeed. Neither is there reference in the New Testament to Christ ever lying down and going to sleep for eight hours and taking a night's sleep. That doesn't mean that he didn't do it. Just because 
There is reference to his weeping. There is reference to his suffering. What I'm saying. There is no reference to his joys, to the happiness he is supposed to have felt. There are a great many things it doesn't mention Jesus doing in the New Testament. Some of the obvious bodily functions and so forth. That doesn't mean that he did not indeed do these. I would say that that's fallacious logic. But rather, you see, just because it isn't mentioned... Dig it, dig it, dig it. Dig it. It's the... If Christ, I mean, if, if they record that Christ cried, and they report that Christ suffered, and they reported that life was really a drag for the guy, why didn't they say that he had any good times at all? Because if he did, they surely should have recorded it. I think they did. Now, they, they, he went to parties, like, he, like the, you know, the time he was changing the water into wine. The wedding in Cana, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like he was a pretty good guy. You know, he knew what he was doing. I think, I think he wouldn't even have been invited to the party in the first place if he hadn't been a joyous kind of person. Another time in the Gospel of John, Jesus says... What? He was a relative. I wanted to make one more point. In the Gospel according to John, it says, on one occasion, Jesus said, I came that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. I think he was a joyous man. He talks about joy, but nowhere is there any evidence that he actually was joyous. What about when Mary Magdalene washed his feet and he stood up for What is that again? When Mary Magdalene washed his feet. Well, he may have, he, he may have laughed then. Maybe it tickled. <laughs> no, I would say that Jesus must have been happy. For example... Thousands of people flocked out to hear Jesus preach on the mountainsides. Yeah, so he and he must have been a person who radiated a kind of joy and a spiritual energy. He must have, I think, or people wouldn't have been as fascinated with what he said. He was talk In fact, he began his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, by saying, Blessed are the pure in heart and so forth. And that word blessed is translated happy in the New Testament. So he was a happy man. I really believe this strongly. I think that he had a good time 24 hours a day because he, he, you know, he knew what he was doing. He knew what was his purpose here in life. He had a good time and was happy 24 hours a day. I think uh, that being an enlightened man, he just had perfect peace. Sure. There is great joy in that, yes. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? You're asking the question Jesus asked James and John? I was just uh, pointing out that it did not uh, uh, show a happy childhood and whatnot. Well, when Jesus was asked by James and John's mothers... An unhappy childhood. Sure, you can make up any kind of peculiar doctrine to explain Jesus' teachings you want to. For example, Dr. Schoenfeld on one occasion said that Jesus must have had a father fixation because his father died when he was young, and this is why he called God Father. I think it's obviously possible to come up with every sort of peculiar interpretation, and people have for centuries. Then tell me, why on earth should I believe your peculiar interpretation? (laughs) Obviously, a person has a choice to believe anything he wants to, and he can. In fact, you can make up your own religion, <laughs> and that may be a great deal of fun. As a matter of fact, I'm busy doing that. We're re- I'm busy resurrecting the worship of the Earth Mother. Well, all this only goes to prove one contention I've made on this campus many times, that man is inherently religious and is going to create a religion if he chooses not to believe one of the existing ones. That's because there's a spiritual craving in the life of man for a transcendent reality and for a loyalty to God. Speak for yourself. I think it... What you say? How do you know? One bit of data on this would be the fact that, according to anthropology, there's not a people or a culture on Earth that does not have some form of religion. Well, uh, there's so many people right now that don't believe in nothing, you know. That I don't see. Uh, I don't see how. Uh, I, I don't. I don't believe in miracles or anything. For example, according to a Gallup poll, 97% of the American population say they believe in God, uh, which. <laughs> is a peculiar. It makes you wonder at the definition of God they would use. Nevertheless, there is basically a spiritual hunger and a spiritual craving and awareness in the lives of people. And they are going to seek after some supreme loyalty or allegiance or another. And that it might as well be to the supreme being, I believe, to be God. Brotherhood of man. Yes, the, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That the entire planet is one family and all men are children of God. If you believe in God, sure. Do you believe in God? No. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Uh, I, I don't feel I don't feel moved, and uh, and I I I don't think that that belief is a is a logical uh, um, is a logical question. No, I wouldn't say that. I just don't I don't believe I I can't feel him. I just don't feel him. In other words, the fact that you do not feel a God indicates to you that for your experience there is no God. That there is no God for me right now. Well, suppose, for example, I have my back turned to a tree, and if I close my eyes and I don't feel the tree, I reach around behind me and I don't touch the bark, would that mean that the tree is not there? In other words, you're not saying that... Standing close enough to it. 
Oh, I see. In other words, you would not be saying that there's not a God there for everybody or for other people. Saying that if I don't feel it, I, I can't see any reason for, for, for acting as if I did. That's the very crucial issue. You were talking about acting as if you did. This is the kind of difference a profound faith in God does make. It does change a person's action. If he believes that he's infinitely loved by God, if a person really comes to the concept, and not just intellectually, but as a matter of feeling, of his experience, that he's infinitely loved by God, that he's a son or daughter of this deity, then he can treat other people in a new way. He has a new self-respect. Yeah, I definitely see religion as, as not only in terms of belief, but in terms of what you do with it. Uh, I, I, I wonder, do you think that, that, that um, to judge the adherence of, of a philosophy uh, is any way to judge the, the, the quality of the philosophy, the truth that the philosophy holds? I would quote William James, who in his Varieties of Religious Experience said, it is better to judge a religion by its fruits than by its roots. If it gives him a new ability to love, if it gives him a new profound inward peace, a sense of joy, these are the fruits of religion. As Jesus said, a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit and a bad tree doesn't bear good ones. But now if you believed that you were worth something and before you had felt that you were worthless, that your life didn't have any particular value, but then suddenly it began to dawn on you that you were valuable. And you heard that Jesus had said that the very number of hairs on your head is known, that that's how much God knows about you, more than you know about yourself, and that he loves you more than you could love yourself. Wouldn't that change your opinion of yourself? If you look at man only materially, you don't take a very high view of his worth and his value, but if you see man as a child of God, spiritually, I think it does make a difference. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to box 347... Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion. How might a person define God? And to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age? The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God getting to know God, and growing spiritually. About the processes of inward discovery, the new power and purposeful resource inherent in living by faith, and another free piece of literature is freedom from fear. The mailing address box 347, Berkeley, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again, box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day.